I was going to say that didn't sound like my voice, but, but, but there you are. So this is a recording. So you now know and you're aware of, of that. Um, my name is David Stringer Lamar. I have a flashing screen in front of me. I think I've just seen myself. Um, and I would like to welcome you to this, the calling window, a tribute to Florence Nightingale in stained uh, glass. Now I can see people uh, coming in, which is terrific. So I I have the honor of being the upper warden here at the virtual company of glaziers and painters of glass and so for you people who are not uh, involved in livery uh, movement etc that means i'm number two we'll be hearing from number one uh, shortly uh, this is a co-production between ourselves and the company uh, of nurses if you see me looking down it's, i'm not watching television i've got another screen here as well uh, that i look look from Really looking forward to this particular webinar tonight. It's our first one uh, in eight months and we have way over 100 people joining us. So it's gone out really well across lots of different uh, particular uh, areas. In terms of the running order, what you will see there, we're gonna have the welcome from the number one to the master Glazier, and then the number one, the master nurse. Then we're going to get into the meat of our conversation taught by artist Sophie Hacker chance to put questions and answers and then we're going to have uh, some closing uh, remarks. Uh, I am here in the City of London as you can see from the backdrop you'll see later when I talk to you about Sophie's book and I will show you the boring white wall that actually exists uh, behind me. Fittingly uh, for the fact that we're with a company of nurses I'm actually here in London Wall in a medical clinic that specializes in menopause. So we have the medical connection as well and the glass connection coming together. Now there is a chat uh, function down there at the bottom. So do share your comment uh, with us uh, as we go, th go through. Uh, but before we get there, I'm always interested to hear where people are actually uh, dialing in from, uh, as it were. So may we have the first poll, please, uh, illustrious clerk. <laughs> There we are. So if you wouldn't mind filling that in. So where are you attending from? The UK, the European Union, the United States or Canada, Australia or New Zealand or elsewhere. So I will give you ooh, 20 seconds or so to fill, fill that out and then it will, be, uh, it will be removed. Now those are quite large uh, areas. So if you want to be more specific then the chat function is there. Do let us know because it's always uh, interesting to hear where our our old friends and our new friends are coming in from, and we have these two great companies um, together. So I'm just gonna count down now. So five, four, three, two, one. If you'd like to take that away and show us the results, please, if we may. Now let's see where our friends are joined. Oh, goodness me, there we are. So, so the UK, we got the United States and Canada. So we are indeed international, so that's very good. If we could close that off now, that'd be fine. Can I close it on mine? Yes, I can. Terrific. Um, and then, of course, the reasons for you being here. Um, we have a, a poll for that one as well. If we have illustrious Clark, if you wouldn't mind bringing that one up. There we are. Fantastic. Glazier. <laughs> Good title. Excellent. Glazier, nurse, nurse or neither. So, yes, I'm a glazier. Yes, I'm a nurse. No, I'm interested in joining. Oh, nice plug there. None of the above. I was just passing and fell into this webinar. So again, if you wouldn't mind uh, filling that out, always engage. Uh, interesting to hear what people are doing. Again, please, if you want to share more information, let us know in the chat, you know, which company you're involved in, what's your business, retire, whatever you're doing. It's always good to, to, to link in. So countdown, five, four, three, two, one. Take it down and the results, please. Yes, I'm a glazier. There we are. Yes, I'm a nurse. No, but I'm interested in joining. Get hold of those people and none of the above. Excellent. So a particular warm welcome to existing uh, uh, glaziers and nurses and a super warm welcome to those of you who are in neither. It's great to, to have you here uh, this evening. So we have the how to engage. So we have the chat facility I've already mentioned about. Uh, the polls we've, we've just been doing. Now, the questions, of course, always very exciting. Those have got to go in the Q&A, and I'll be pulling out those, uh, those from there later. 
but you can actually vote for them. You don't have to ask a question. You can actually upvote them so it, so it does move them up. So do keep your eyes on the questions and answer ones. And particularly, Sophie's asked me, if you've got any technical and really difficult questions, she'd look forward to uh, potentially answering those as well. And should there be anything to do with nursing, we also have the, the master nurse here uh, as well. I'm, I'm sure she'd be very happy uh, to get engaged uh, with, with that. Okay, so we have the format of the, of the evening. Oh, and a poll here. So this is actually a question, and I'll, I'll tell you the answer later on, or in fact, the, the master nurse will. How many lamps did Florence Nightingale bring back with her? None, five or six as personal mementos, several hundred for the benefit of London hospitals. You have a choice of three. Everybody, please cast your uh, best vote for that particular one, and we will reveal the answer later. And as it says, you've only got one choice. Let me see if I'm allowed to vote. Yes, can I pull it there? There we are. There we are. Excellent. I'll give you so 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Remove it, please. And then we will come back to it later on. Okay, it's now my great pleasure and privilege indeed to invite the Master Glazier Phil Forty to address us. Master. Uh, thank you, Rent um, Appa. Good evening and from the United Kingdom and welcome to this, the first webinar of 2022 arranged by the Worshipful Company of Glaziers and Painters of Glass, London. We are delighted to see such a large number of part participants um, we have masters and wardens from many other livery companies, and we are particularly glad to see guests here from the company of nurses uh, who are joining us for this very special occasion. You are all most welcome. Our presenter this evening is Sophie Hacker, a freeman of our company. Sophie is an established artist who works in many media and techniques with a special interest in church art, an area where stained glass is very prominent. Sophie was mentored in her glasswork by leading artists, and we are today going to hear about her creation of one window in particular, featuring Florence Nightingale, the calling window. The window was commissioned by members of the Nightingale family and anonymous donors, and Sophie carried out meticulous research into her subject to give inspiration for this very complex design full of allusions and references, which we shall be learning about as we take a detailed look at the piece. Although the window was commissioned before the outbreak of COVID and completed during the pan pandemic, now could not be a better time to look upon the legacy left by Fran Florence as we start to emerge from the, towards norm normality with a huge debt of gratitude to members of the nursing profession. I shall therefore invite Francis Davis, Master of the Company of Nurses, to say a few words before we hear from Sophie. Master, thank you. I'm delighted to be here this evening and thank you for inviting the Company of Nurses to join this webinar. Florence Nightingale is clearly an important person in the history of our profession and her legacy can be found in nursing standards and hospital design principles to this day. Not only did she have a meticulous attention to detail and record keeping, but she also saw the patients as human beings and she restored a sense of humanity to those injured soldiers in Scutari. She laid a foundation for modern nursing today by establishing the Nightingale Training School for Nursing and her book, Notes on Nursing, published in 1860, has relevance today. Florence Nightingale was known as the Lady of the Lamp, following pictures of her walking the wards at night to tend to the sick soldiers at Scutari Hospital. She did not particularly like this description, but it was one that she was synonymous with. The lamp that she carried was not the traditional genie style lamp, but a Turkish lantern, like this. And I'm delighted to say that the company of nurses use replicas of this lamp to honour the tradition of passing a loving cup at company banquets and dinners. The Company of Nurses is relatively new to the livery world, achieving guild status in 2016. In 2020, on the 200th birthday of Florence Nightingale, 
we were awarded company without livery status. From the beginning, we decided that using a loving cup did not fit with the infection control measures that as nurses we aspire to, and so adopted the approach of passing the lamp. And it's very poignant our dinners to share this tradition with our freemen and guests. I believe that Florence would have approved of our decision and it has certainly proved advantageous following COVID. 2020 was a very special year for nurses as it was designated the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. There were many celebrations planned, many focused around Florence Nightingale and her bicentenary. Sadly, so many of those were canceled. We had hoped as a company of nurses to attend the unveiling of the calling window at Romsey in May 2020, but as with all those event, as with all events that year, it didn't take place. I and the company of nurses are so pleased to be here this evening and hear from Sophie about how she designed and made this calling window. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, both masters, uh, for that. There's quite a few messages in the chat. Uh, can I just um, ask people to actually put to everybody, it's nice me personally hearing from you, but it, it'd be great if you could share it as well. But we certainly have greetings here from the master Laundra, someone saying hello from Wrexham in Wales, Bristol, uh, East Riding of Yorkshire, greetings from the master uh, prime warden, sorry, basket makers, master Carmen, uh, master apothecaries is also saying hello and uh, a lady called Julie, co-author of a book entitled Florence Nightingale's London in partnership with the Florence Nightingale Museum is also saying hello to us. So thank you very much for, for sharing those. And if you do want to put something in the chat, do select to everybody. Right, we're here. It's the moment. We're ready. Let's go. Sophie Hacker, visual artist. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you, David. Can I just start by saying, please don't ask me any technical questions because I couldn't answer them, <laughs> being mischievous. So I'm going to take a whistle stop tour through um, my research, which is, of course, where you have to start with any new project. And so the first sort of 10 minutes or so, what I'm going to talk about for, your, for the nurses who are here will probably be very well known already. Um, but then I'm going to go into talk about how I managed to distill all of my thoughts into the design that you can see a little bit of on this first screen. So thanks, Liz. On the 12th of May in 1820, in the city of Florence, uh, a second daughter was born to William and Francis. And some of you may not know that she was called Florence Nightingale simply because she was born in Florence. So William and Francis were respectable, they were wealthy, but their money was fairly new. Uh, William inherited from a rather cantankerous old uncle who wouldn't leave his money to a woman. And there is a glorious irony for me that this money educated one of Victorian England's most influential women and enabled her to break away from the life that was mapped out for her by society. William and Francis had very progressive political ideals and connections, and many of their close friends and even their relatives were actively involved in things like anti-slavery and women's suffrage. And I think it would be fair to assume that that had a very formative effect on the young Florence. Thanks, Liz. This lovely sketch is of Florence by her older sister, Parthenope. And I just want to point out, it does include um, a little portrait of Athena, who you can see sitting on the pedestal there. Athena was her pet owl that she found uh, in the rubble in Greece and she brought it back to England. And it was her treasured pet until she left for Scutari. What you can see here is an elegant, poised, very well-dressed young woman, but really it was a gilded cage because Florence had been born into privilege and money and the expectation was that she would marry well, she'd have lots and lots of children, she'd run a large household, fundamentally she would support her husband but that wasn't Nightingale's plan at all. And she knew that it wasn't God's plan for her 
either. But we have to bear in mind that there were no role models for Florence to look up to. There were no examples of women who'd stepped aside outside of the normal expectations of the sort of high society that she'd been born into. And let's consider the obstacles. Women weren't even allowed to travel freely unless they were in the company of their husbands or their family, or they had very substantial private means. And just look at the dress she's wearing. Victorian dress for women was very restrictive. There were corsets, huge sleeves, and floor length voluminous skirts. Hugely impractical, really. Thanks, Liz. But Nightingale really loved her family and she really did try her very best to conform. But eventually, by the time that she got to around about 30 after a few um, proposals of marriage, which she refused, um, it eventually became obvious to everybody that the expectations weren't going to be fulfilled. And her father, with, with great generosity and a certain amount of foresight, I think, granted her an allowance which would facilitate her interest in nursing and uh, she wouldn't suffer the ignominy of drawing a salary. And I'm very sorry to say amongst the assembled company that this must have been a double blow for her family because not only was she not marrying, but she wanted to nurse. And it pains me to say this, but nurses at this time had a very low social status. They were considered morally deficient and frankly, they were likely to be on the gin. But the allowance meant that she could finally travel alone. And her first experience of nursing was in 1851 when she was 31 and it was in Germany. And then she had some hospital experience in Paris. Thanks, Liz. She came back to England and in 1854, she became superintendent at the fabulously named Establishment for Gentlewomen during temporary illness. And this building in Harley Street is on the site of where that building was. It's not the same one, but it's, it's, where, it was, it's where it was. And at the time, there was a terrible cholera epidemic in London. And patients for this establishment for gentlewomen mostly came from a very poor area around Rathbone Place, where you could now pick up a studio flat for about £850,000. Anyway, this is where Nightingale really established herself in London. And if we go to our next slide, please, Liz, we can see that at the same time, there was the most disastrous war with Russia. The casualties were terribly high, but in fact, infections were killing more men than bullets or shells. The wounded soldiers were sent 300 miles across the Black Sea to Scutari in Istanbul in overcrowded and squalid ships, and many of them died on that journey. Next slide, please, Liz. This is the first time for the British public that they really understood in real time, pretty much, what was actually going on at the front. Because correspondents like William Howard Russell of the London Times were on the ground and they were sending absolutely extraordinary coverage of what was happening, for example, at the Charge of the Light Brigade. And there was massive public pressure to do something. Thanks, Liz. So Henry Herbert, sorry, Sidney Herbert was the secretary at war at the time. And he was also a close personal friend of Florence. And he knew of her work in Harley Street and knew that she had managerial skills and lots of experience. So he sent her here to Scutari Barracks Hospital with the first team of nurses. And they arrived to completely horrific conditions. There wasn't enough of anything useful, there were no bandages, there wasn't enough soap, the wards were overcrowded, they were filthy. One nurse wrote back, um, one poor fellow 
neglected by the orderlies because he was dying, was very dirty, covered with wounds and devoured by lice. I pointed this out to the orderlies whose excuse was, it's not worthwhile to clean him. He's not long for this world. This is an anathema to every nurse. But the women were not wanted there by doctors. They frankly couldn't see the point of them. And the idea of working collaboratively with a woman like Florence was totally alien to them. Thanks, Liz. We've already heard uh, from the master of the nurses company how Nightingale would travel the wards at night with her wonderful Turkish candle lamp that we've got here. And this is taken from the museum. And she also took the opportunity to write home the letters from soldiers who were too frail to write their own. And of course, that was an act of practical kindness that was above and beyond just the call of nursing, but it really made a massive impact. Nightingale discovered that the hospital had been built over a blocked sewage system and she cleaned relentlessly. She brought in bandages, blankets. She managed to create fresh air in the wards. She separated the beds which had been pushed very close together to reduce cross-contamination. She kept wounds clean and she created a very orderly, hygienic, wholesome space. Thanks, Liz. These same war correspondents who had been alerting the public to the horrors of what was happening now alerted to the public, the public to the changes that Nightingale was making. And what happened was she became idealized, romanticized. I think these images portray her like a saint or Madonna. And when she came back to England, she was actually quite shocked to discover that she was fundamentally as famous as Queen Victoria, but she was canny and she realized that she could put her fame to good use. Thanks, Liz. Her two years at Scutari changed everything. She began research into the causes of high death rates in war hospitals. She began publishing seminal works on nursing. We've heard some already. And of course she opened the nurse Nightingale School at St. Thomas's. Florence Nightingale changed the world through medical statistics, public health policy, hospital design, patient care, and she basically invented the role of the modern nurse. Thanks, Liz. How on earth was I, as an artist, going to try and distill all of that into a single image that could stand for her legacy. That was my challenge. And my first port of call was the fabulous Nightingale Museum. It's a brilliant place. And the key moments of her life and her career are laid out in a series of pods. And this is the first pod. And there's a bench located on which is carved on February 7th, 1837, God spoke to me and called me to his service. And when I saw that bench, this was my way into the project. It was my light bulb moment. It really called to me. Thanks, Liz. I discovered that this tenacious woman, she wasn't shaped by norms or expectations of society, but by vision and determination and energy. And it all stemmed from this moment. And this is my image. This is how I pictured the moment that she described being called by God. She described many times in her diary about how important this call was, how it was the start of everything. And the composition kind of leapt fully formed into my mind. I think I felt so called by this because it's a perfect opportunity also for me to explore and share something that I deeply believe that we're all called. It's not something that just special, or gifted, unique people experience. And it certainly isn't exclusively for people of faith. Calling is a universal truth. Now there's no 
image of this moment in her life. We know that she was sitting on a bench. We know that she was sitting under a cedar tree in her garden. And I went back to the place where it happened and effectively composed this from fragments that I was able to put together. And I divided it antiphonally. So if we see the next slide, please, Liz. You can see that the top half of the window um, is held like a cross. The words, the call, are held within this cross of light. And the words, lo, it is I, is a phrase that Nightingale used many, many times. And it's her praise of a moment that you hear in the gospels when Jesus is walking on the water. And effectively what he's doing is he's stepping over the chaos of the world and bringing calm. And she found those words, in fact, she described them as the four words of single syllables that sum up the Christian faith. So it was wonderful to be able to use them to represent the call that she heard in her own life. And the cross is revealed in two ways. First, through the swinging lead lines that I've used, and secondly, in the way that the light breaks through the trees. So the, the cedar tree that she sat beneath has this very distinctive split trunk, which you can see either side of her here. Any stained glass artist knows <laughs> that lead lines are absolutely crucial in designing any window. They're never accidental, um, but every artist has their own particular decision-making process about how to use them. Also, it's worth pointing out that Good Friday is the most important day in the Christian year for Florence Nightingale because it's the union of sacrifice and love. And that's what she held most important. So another reason why using the imagery of the cross was relevant for this window. Thanks, Liz. And then the response is held in the lower half of the window, all within this upward pointing triangle where the apex sits on her nose, the nose of her profile, as she turns towards the call. Now, this is a window about a very famous woman of whom there are very few photographs because she really didn't like the fame. She didn't like photographs being taken of herself. She was very modest, actually. Um, so it seemed inappropriate to make a portrait of her, which is why I chose to have her turning away also, by turning away, she's directing our, the viewer, the viewer's gaze through to what's mattering to her, which is the moment of call. She holds her pen in her hand, pausing from her habit of making notes in her Bible. And her face, the Bible and the books lying at her feet are all connected along the right hand side of the triangle. The words of her response sit along the base of the window. And the quote is from the book of Isaiah, specifically what's known as part of Isaiah's great commission. And this particular response in Isaiah is her other most important quote. So in the research, this is one of the things I discovered that lo, it is I and here am I Lord, send me. Those are the seminal texts of her own life. Thanks, Liz. I also use the, the language of flowers because I'm trying to bring together disparate moments. So the moment of her birth, which is symbolized by Lily of the Valley, the, the birth flower for May, the uh, primrose for February, which is the moment of her call, and the snowdrop. Now we get lots and lots of snowdrops in the UK, but some of them, including the ones in this photograph that I took in Burley Wood, actually started life on the slopes of the Crimean battlefields. And the um, soldiers there actually uh, sent home, posted home the bulbs of the snowdrops where, the, where they collected them back to their loved ones in the UK. And rather wonderfully, um, I was able to go and photograph some of these when they came into flower, into bloom, um, in time to include them in my window. Thanks, Liz. go back one. Thanks. 
And here I am in my fabulous red boots. Um, and this, these are the three flowers that have been uh, depicted in glass, the snowdrop, the lily of the valley and the primrose. And this photograph was taken on installation day. It's a very big moment um, in the life of somebody who makes a stained glass window because until it's installed, it doesn't exist as an object. Um, it's only in sections. And so the moment that it actually goes in is a very exciting, but equally terrifying moment. And this was only my third stained glass window. So I didn't have the, the backdrop of loads of experience to feel confident that I'd done a, a, a good job. Um, and sometimes when you put them in, you get little pinpricks of light where you haven't maybe quite got the balance of paint quite right. And you have the opportunity of doing something called cold painting, which is what I'm doing here. Just adding a tiny little bit of an earth colored acrylic paint to just knock out the very, very bright lights to um, make sure that it doesn't feel um, sort of unbalanced in any part. Now the window itself sits at least 15 foot above ground level. So this is the only opportunity I was ever gonna have um, to do it. Uh, when the scaffolding was up. Thanks, Liz. And um, I'm a terrible anorak about stained glass. If you, if you ask me any questions about how it's made, you will have to sit down for a very long time because I'll take forever to answer the questions. But I wanted to just show you this slide because it's as close as I ever got to seeing it looking finished but it's not a vertical picture, it's a flat picture. And I'm, I'm actually above it, looking down through a claptrap in Holywell glass in Wells, which is where the acid etching and the firing and the second painting were done. And it enables me to show you things like, if you look where the trunks are, you can see red, slight slithers of red. And that's because the tree trunks were made from plating green glass and red glass together to get a lovely rich mottled brown and then I carved uh, letters that I'm just about to show you in the next slide which I can describe in a moment but it just gives you a sense of how things came together and I've just circled the urn with a white circle there which is the urn that William was leaning against in the photograph right at the very beginning. Thanks Liz. This is also taken on the installation day where I'm able to put the two halves of the window on one screen to see them a little bit closer. And here you can see the, the words a little clearer. Blessed be the merciful. These were carved into a beautiful brooch designed by Prince Albert and presented to Nightingale when she returned from Scutari. Um, is a very elegant and beautiful um, brooch. And on the other side, it says, I was sick and she nursed me, which was one of Nightingale's own sort of paraphrases again of um, a, a biblical uh, script that she said to her nurses repeatedly, we must see every person as though they were Christ and treat them accordingly. Very important. Thanks, Liz. There are three different birds in the window. Uh, right at the very top are tiny little silhouettes of swallows. They're there to represent resurrection because up until Gilbert White in the 18th century, the assumption was that swallows buried themselves underground in the winter uh, because they didn't understand migration. And then they resurrected in the spring. So that's they've always represented resurrection as a result. There's a singing nightingale um, I don't mention her name in my window. There is no lamp. There are no nurses. There are no soldiers. How do we know it's Florence Nightingale? We have a Nightingale and shortly we'll see that we have Florence as well. And there's Athena, her ferocious little owl who pecked everybody apart from Florence, adored Florence and lived in her pocket. Um, so I had to include her and she represents, uh, um, Athena stands there to represent Nightingale's family and her personal life. Thanks, Liz. There on her lap is the Bible open at Isaiah, 
where we hear the words of Isaiah's great commission, here am I, Lord, send me. And again, it reminds us that she was a woman of very deep and active, though slightly unorthodox faith, very, very interesting woman. And uh, as I've already stressed, she, she didn't want anybody to have prince or pauper in their mind. She wants her nurses to treat everybody the same. Thanks, Liz. And far away in the distance, between the two trunks of the tree, in the light of the cross, we have these four buildings. There's Florence, there's the Duomo in Florence, um, the place of her birth. Then to the right, we have Scutari Barracks Hospital. Then to the left again, we have one of many, many general infirmaries. This one in Hampshire, which is where Romsey is located, uh, that she helped to design using her pavilion style wards with fresh air and natural light. And then at the bottom is St. Thomas's Hospital, where she set up her nursing school, of course. And the place I think we could say is one of her greatest achievements, where nurses finally began to be valued, appreciated and respected. Thanks, Liz. The pile of books at her feet, well, they are there to symbolize her learning, highly educated, intensely intelligent woman, but also her own prolific publications, over 200 in total. Uh, they include notes on nursing, suggestions for thought, notes on hospitals, sanitary statistics, directions for cooking by troops in camp, and so on. Uh, countless papers, pamphlets promoting public health, understanding, sanitation, and faith. She was the first woman to be admitted to the Royal Statistical Society. She was the first person to be awarded the Royal Red Cross for exceptional services in military nursing. And she was the first woman to receive the Order of Merit. Thanks, Liz. Here's my last slide. And it's simply to say that the talk is dedicated to Florence Nightingale, but the window is dedicated to everybody who wants to reach out to their calling, whatever that would be and however they find it. Thank you. Superb, thank you ever so much, uh, Sophie, for, for that. Um, you've probably been too busy to see, there's been lots of uh, comments in the chat and I've received some uh, personally saying how much people are enjoying it and how you're bringing all these different strands um, together. Uh, we have three questions in the Q&A. Before we go there, uh, people, if you do have some questions and do, do pop, pop them in there, you can also upvote um, to say which is the ones you particularly like. But before we go there, I, I'd like to ask some questions, if I may, because mm. you've been talking about this calling uh, and that we have one and it's a universal uh, aspect. You mentioned that this was your third window. How did you come across your calling for stained glass and how did you get involved with it? How about that? There's two That's questions. Great. That's really great. So, uh, yes, um, I discovered stained glass. Well, I, I, get, I got my first opportunity to work in stained glass um, about uh, 11 years ago. And um, it was through a very weird set of circumstances that brought me into uh, a meeting with the probably one of the finest stained glass artists working today, a chap called Tom Denny. And uh, by the most extraordinary coincidence, somebody who I had met said to me one day, my church has just been given some money. I'd like you to make a stained glass window. And I said, oh, I've never made a stained glass window. He said, no, I know, but I think you'd be really good. <laughs> I phoned up Tom Denny, whom I'd just met, and um, I told him what had happened. And he said, well, come and see me and I'll tell you how to do it. And he did. So um, it was absolutely amazing. And I'm so grateful to him because although I've been a, an artist for a, a professional artist for 30 years, um, I've worked in many, many different mediums and currently am at the moment. I'm working in textiles and bronze and um, all sorts of other things. Um, but if I could only choose one for the rest of my life, 
it would be glass um, because it's amazing. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that indeed. Um, I wish as I walked down the, down the streets here in my various companies, someone said to me, I've got some money. Do you want to do something? For I, know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so that's very good indeed. We'll have to get some. <laughs> I shall wander around later. <laughs> Uh, right, okay, Let's. Uh, this, questions are building up now, so I'm going to whiz over there. I had some more difficult ones for you. Maybe I'll pull them in later. Okay, let me see what I have. So the top voted for window at the moment says, out of interest, Sophie, what influenced your colour choice for the stained glass for the window? Brilliant question. That is fantastic. Um, well... I, bizarrely, I'm actually an abstract artist, really. So it was very interesting to have the challenge of doing something so figurative. So the colours of the glass sort of decided themselves because of the vision that I had of a Victorian young woman sitting in the gardens of Embley Park. And I wanted a very natural palette um, that spoke to the reality of that moment. So it's not too fanciful in that respect. Also, the window is on the north side of Romsey Abbey. And that means that there's a lovely, steady light throughout the year. So it's a, it's a relatively cool palette. Blues and greens are quite cool, although there's a lot of gold as well in the silver stain. Um, and that means that you can read those colors pretty consistently through the year. Um, so I was able to use the location as well to inform the colour. Excellent. Thank you very, very much uh, for that. Let me see here. Two, oh no, three votes. Oh, people are voting now. I like that. Makes it very exciting. So uh, how many pieces of glass are contained within the window? Oh, wait a minute. Sneaky here. A second question. How long to create the window from start to finish? So first of all, how many pieces of glass and how long did it all take? Answer the first one I didn't count. Oh. Um, <laughs> I should have done really because I moved them around about oh I don't know forty times probably from tray to tray and and uh, yeah I, I don't know how many pieces are but I most of the window is plated which means that there are actually two pieces of glass, uh, not just one. With, so for example in the trees there's red glass and there's green glass. So, um, I mean, if I counted the glass through the lead lines, maybe there's like 150 pieces, but then you've got to almost double that for the plating. So about 300. And what was the other question? Uh, how long did it take from uh, take? start to finish? Yeah, well, COVID happened. COVID happened. So longer than I anticipated, but actually, um, so this is a, this was teamwork very definitely, I, I, you know, I had help. I didn't do the leading, I've got to admit, didn't lead myself. Um, also, I had the help of some fantastic people at Holywell who showed me how to, you know, set the right timings for the kiln, helped me with the acid etching, um, you know, did amazing, amazing support. Um, so I would have to say probably, uh, 18 months from start to finish, about. Great, thank, thank you very much. So I think just for the audience there, we don't really know how many pieces of glass were involved. I'm not really sure how long it took, but there were many pieces of glass and it took about one and a half years. Excellent, right, let's move onwards. Uh, brilliant presentation, thank you. What are the dimensions of the window? Uh, it's 46 square foot if that helps. Um, so it's something like about sort of six foot wide and about uh, 10 or 12 foot high, something like that. If okay. that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, that's good for me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, what are swinging lead lines? Ah, oh, that's just, that's just my, that's just my word. Um, so some, so Tom, who I learned with, Tom taught me how to acid etch. Tom taught me how to paint on glass. 
Uh, Tom taught me how to create the acid plan. Um, but what Tom didn't make me do was lead lines like Tom does. So Tom's lead lines go wiggle, 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 like that. So Tom does wiggly lines. And I do simple, as you can see on this little piece on the screen, my lines just kind of so swinging. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm sure the audience like I also really appreciated the sound <laughs> effects. So, so that's very good indeed. Right, what do we have here from Roger? Oh, no, we had that one uh, da, 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 from Graham. The design of the window is striking. Did you have any other preliminary designs that you rejected or, or modified? Um, I mean, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that I took quite a long time to settle on the final composition and what to leave in and what to take out. So at various times there were soldiers um, and they came out. Um, there was never a lamp and there was never a nurse's uniform, but there were very, there were going to be various things like foxes about for bizarre reasons, which I won't go into now. Um, so I took quite a lot of time to make those final decisions and how big Nightingale should be in the design because she's the she's the star of the show um uh but in terms of did I change the overall concept no I always knew that I wanted the design to be about this moment that mattered so much to her where everything started which was she felt called by God to to take on the the life that she then um followed so that was always fixed. Great, but thank you very much indeed. I'm going to ask my own little question there. How come the soldiers didn't appear in it? So you said you put them in, but then they came out again, because that was obviously part of what was occurring, and you mentioned it in your presentation. So how come they got booted out? Because they don't define her. Um, it was incredibly important, and the whole lady with the lamp thing came out as a result of her work at Scutari, but she was only at Scutari for two years, um, you know, she had a very full life and changed enormous things like sanitation, but there are no toilets in my window. So, you know, there's lots of things she did as well as nurse soldiers. So I felt that um, I wanted that the buildings, so Scutari Barracks represents her time as the lady with the lamp. And then St. Thomas's Hospital represents her school of nursing and you know so all of those symbols are kind of placeholders for the particular episodes of her life. Thank, thank you very much indeed now this is not a question but I found it interesting so uh, did you know that Florence Nightingale received the freedom of the City of London? I did not know that. She presented with a wooden casket which is in the Lord Chamberlain suite in the Guildhall. Oh, wow. so, that's good. so thank you for, for sharing that with us. Uh, where we go here oh if I would like to travel from Wales to see the window how easy is it to access Romsey Abbey actually from Wales it's quite easy because I think the Cardiff to Romsey is a direct train <laughs> okay. um, there's a station in Romsey if you're using public transport and Romsey is a small place so it's a very short walk from the station to Romsey Abbey um, the Abbey now, uh, I believe, is open all day. I mean, when it first went in, it was only open for a couple of hours a day because of COVID and all the rest of it. But it's now functioning normally. It's worth checking on their website to make sure that there aren't special services or special closures for funerals or something like that. But uh, it should be generally easy to see from Wales. Great, thank you very much. And you mentioned the website there, which will no doubt have lots of other information in there yeah. as well. That will be most useful. Yeah. Let's see what we have here. Ah, here's a question about your 18 months or so. Uh, did you work solely on this project during the 18 months or did you also do other work? I also did other work. Um, what did I, what was I working on at the time? I think I was working on an altar frontal for Winchester Cathedral um, and a cross um, for the Bishop of London. 
So those were the two things. So I was working in wood and I was working in textiles as well. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, indeed. <laughs> There's one here. I, I, you don't probably have to answer this immediately. I pulled it out of the, the, the chat. It says, uh, can we also have the dimensions? In metric, oh, please. Heck. In metric. <laughs> <laughs> there is the answer. Oh, my God. I don't know. I, I, I want to say it's all about yeah. inclusion. It's all about inclusion. You know, we might have Brexit, I but know, we've still got metric. I, I, I'm, really, I'm really embarrassed that I don't know the answers to that. No, it's fine. Um, we'll move on. Don't worry yeah, about that. Yeah. Uh, do, do, do. And it's got here. How did you uh, acid etch? What kind of acid was used? Ooh. Are these technical enough? Ooh. Ha -ha. Okay. Now, any scientists amongst you will know that hydrofluoric acid is really nasty stuff. Um, and it, if you drop some on your hand, it'll keep burning till it comes out the other side. It, the fumes are carcinogenic um, and you have to wear, you have to kind of protect your own glasses because the fumes can damage your spectacles. It's really nasty. There's no way I could have acid etched at home, which is where Holywell comes in because they actually have an acid bay, like a, like a huge fume cupboard. Um, and you put your hands in gauntlets and manipulate one piece or two pieces of glass at a time. And a little tiny layer of hydrofluoric acid in a tray, if it's neat, will dissolve a piece of glass in five minutes. It's, it's horrific stuff. Um, but it provides the most succulent, amazing technical um, responses in glass. I mean, the little tiny fragment, this is not my best piece of painting. This, this is about the size of a large postage stamp, uh, this, this, this painting of, um, of the Duomo. Um, but the green bit that you can see to the left of that, that's been acid etched by um, bitumen being put onto the glass with um, a, um, what's it called, like um, a box cutter blade. I just can't think what it's called for a moment. Um, a Stanley knife blade. So sort of getting some bitumen on the blade and then going like that with bitumen. And then you bitumen dries and then you put the piece of glass into the tray of hydrofluoric acid and the acid will eat away the colour where the bitumen isn't. So then you take it out and then you can change the mask, put some different bitumen on, put it back in. You can do that as many times as you want. And each time you take the glass out, the green bit has got paler, but where you've had the bitumen, it stays fully green. And so I did that all the way over uh, the window um, and it enabled me, for example, where it gets to Nightingale's profile, her face, that was on a piece of green glass, but her face isn't green because I took all the green off so that I could use a lovely uh, um, paint to reveal her flesh tones. Excellent. So, Can I just stop you there, unfortunately? Yes. That, that is fascinating without out of doubt. And I I'm did sure warn you I was an anorak. <laughs> I no, got it there. You have lived up to that. So, so well done <laughs> in, indeed. So, so excellent. Good work on that. We still have seven more questions, but uh, that is the, the time where we have to stop for the, the questions and answers. So terrific, Sophie. Thank you very much. There's loads of positive comments uh, in the chat there. And I say many more questions that we, we couldn't get around to. You'll see I've changed the background. So now you're seeing the full glory of the inside of the medical clinic uh, here in London. Right, here we go. How many lamps did Florence Nightingale bring back from Scutari? What did the polls show, Glorious Clark? None. So none was the winner at 44%, five or six, 18%, and several hundred. So there we are. Master Nurse, are you still online, as it were? Are you still there? Would you mind giving us the answer? The answer is five lamps that ah. Florence Nightingale bought, just five. So, in fact, that was the third answer. So, so there we are. So, uh, very interesting indeed. So, five of them. I'm now going to show you a book, which you can see clearly against this exciting back, backdrop here of the clinic. 
particularly designed for it. So this is Sophie Hacker's book, and it is called The Calling Window, Celebrating Florence Nightingale, or foreword by the Bishop of London. So the whole thing is in here. There's no doubt lots of things about acid etching, uh, swinging lead lines, calling and everything else. Should you wish to get hold of this book, you can look on Sophie Hacker's website, or as we've seen for somebody, they're going to go to the Abbey, you can also get it there as well. I believe, remember, inflation's going up, so no doubt the price of this will be going up soon, so get them while they're still uh, at a, a price you may wish to, to pay. So thank you very much for that. It's now my pleasure to hand back to the number one, the master, Glazier, master. Thank you, David. On behalf of all of you, I'd like to thank Sophie for this fascinating insight into the detail of this window. And I'm sure it will encourage many of you to want to go and see it for yourselves. We're very grateful for the work that you've put into creating this webinar. And I'd also like to thank our anchor man, Upper Warden David Stringer Lamar, and our learned clerk, Liz Wicksteed, for their behind the scenes contribution to this evening's event. Our next webinar will be on the 22nd of March, when Glazier Leone Seliger and Professor Ian Freeston will be talking about dating stained glass and revealing some of the secrets about what has been discovered at Canterbury. We hope that many of you will join us again then. Thank you very much, uh, Monster. I believe now you bought the t-shirt at the calling window. There it is as well. I mean, you just can't get this kind of promotion, can you? Internationally based. Now, if I may call upon the glamorous clock. Thank you very much um, for that. And so this is just briefly to tell people um, partly about being able to go and see the window. There's the, there's the website for Sophie's address for the book and the website for going to visit Romsey Abbey which I'm very happy to send to people if that would be helpful. And uh, I've actually been to Romsey Abbey myself and seen it, and it's beautiful. It's, it's worth the journey because the photos really can't do justice to seeing the light um, that the Abbey, that, that you get when you are actually there and you see the Abbey for real. Uh, I just thought I would mention that we are always open for more members here at the Glaziers, more fascinating talks about glass, uh, lots of exciting things to do and exciting people to meet. And here is the link to our website if you would like to apply. We consider new applications several times a year and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, anyone applying by the end of March will be considered at the next opportunity. Finally, here are just some information about how to keep in touch with us. Our website is there, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel where you can see our previous webinars and in due course, this one will be posted there. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for that. It's been a great pleasure to be involved. I very much uh, enjoyed it. Thank you ever so much for all the, the questions uh, that were asked and all, all the comments. Uh, it does make it so much uh, more fun where there is so much in interaction. So a big thank you from me to everybody involved with this uh, before and during. It's a team effort and lots of, uh, lots of pieces have to come together. Just like Sophie, I've got no idea how many pieces are involved, but it probably took less than 18 months to put this uh, webinar um, together. So thank you to the master glazier, the master nurse, uh, the clerk of the Worshipful Company of Glaziers, uh, the clerk of the uh, Company of Nurses, John Allen, thanks, thanks for everything in for that. And of course, thank you very much to our star of the show, Sophie Hacker, for doing so well. Great stuff. And should you wish to, to join us in terms of membership, you don't have to be a glass artist or conservator, et cetera, but you probably would like to be interested in how much acid is used and when. So we are a very welcome, a warm, warm company. Thank you ever so much for the company of nurses for, for being our terrific, friendly partners uh, on this webinar. So it's good evening from the team. Good evening for me. Thank you for joining us.